So welcome everyone. And welcome. I see a few new faces and a few I was gonna say old faces, but I'll say <laughs> people that I know. <laughs> uh, how many of you are new to the group? Okay, just a couple. So welcome. So yeah, I'm sorry for not um, introducing the format of the group. Um, I know one of you at least came in during the, the meditation, but uh, we we sit for 35 minutes and then I give a short talk and then we have a dialogue about the talk or about what's happening uh, in our in our practice. So um, yeah, today we're talking about the seven. We're beginning a new series on the seven factors of enlightenment. So. Uh, it's a brand new series, a good time if you're just coming in to start with us. And it's a very interesting um, series of talks. Uh, covers a lot of ground, right from mindfulness, right down to uh, you know equanimity and everything in between. <laughs> and I think I'd really like to dig deep into these um, factors if uh, people are willing to um, stick with me on on this. Um, I mean, we can have one talk on mindfulness and kind of scratch the surface on what mindfulness is, but we can also get quite in-depth in terms of what mindfulness is, what letting go is, what are the attitudes we bring to bear when we practice mindfulness, how do we uh, how can mindfulness be integrated into our lives? How can it be made more continuous throughout our days as opposed to just something that happens in the morning and then in the daytime we're just triggered like every other day? Um, there's just so many ways that we can just um, uh, dive into uh, what mindfulness alone is. And the other, the other factors, so there's seven. Mindfulness is the, num is the first one. It's really the root one that's required to uh, to, to start uh, into the process, and they do they build on one another. So it is a, a building process with the seven factors. Uh, the, the second one is um, investigation, and again, I'd really like to spend some time on this um, topic because. Uh, as one of my teachers said, um, mindfulness alone is not enough. Or he always says, awareness alone is not enough. I also need to uh, deeply see and understand what is arising so that learning can occur. Um, so this is where the, the wisdom aspect and investigation comes in. And it's not analysis in the way that we commonly think of it. It's a way of of deeply seeing and understanding. And then comes uh, energy or effort, which is another one of my favorites in a way it's so important how we bring energy or effort to the practice so that we're not you know, striving or over-efforting, um, bringing a tightness. So it's a, re a relaxed attitude to the practice, but also a real energy, energetic um, um, energetic, uh, putting energy into the process, let's put it that way. And then, so I, those three I'd really like to spend some time on, so more than three sessions, in other words. Um, then the, the, the last ones are, uh, the last four are um, joy, which we just covered in the, uh, um, the four Brahma Viharas. But I can't speak enough about joy, especially in these times. And we actually spoke a lot about how to bring joy to the practice in the midst of a, of a pandemic and the suffering that's going along with that. And uh, same, with, same with the other. The fifth is calm. So this calmness or uh, tranquility of mind that we bring to the practice. The sixth is uh, concentration. So again, steadying the mind. And then really when I talk about bringing your awareness to the breath and the guided meditation, that's a, can be seen as a way to kind of steady 
our um, focus as kind of an anchor. And the seventh is equanimity, uh, which we also discussed in the four, the last series on the four Brahma Paharas, but we, I'd like to go into that too in, in a bit more depth. So those are the seven uh, factors of enlightenment, and today is um, uh, mindfulness. So <clears throat> the um, mindfulness, as I said, is the root or the basis of all the uh, factors. And it's, you know, you've probably all heard, um, you know, John Kabat-Zinn's kind of definition, um, being in the present moment, um, paying attention to the present moment, uh, non-judgmentally and on purpose. I think that's how he basically words it. So it, he brings in, you know, the, the key factors really, presenting the intention to practice, doing it with a, a non-judgmentally, so with accepting whatever's arising into awareness, and uh, all uh, in the present moment to, to, to what's arising. So we're maintaining that awareness of the present moment, of, of the objects, you could say, that are arising into the present moment, objects such as sounds, smells, tastes, if you have taste while you're meditating, um, yeah, of thoughts is the other. So it's the five senses plus thoughts. This is kind of seen as the sixth sense door. So we're just really guarding those sense doors in the sense and seeing what's arising to them. And what's our reaction to what's arising to them. That's it. It sounds so simple. <laughs> Because that's really all it is. <laughs> so really, when I start to, 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 as I say, dig deep into this, we're really looking at all the things that can go wrong. It's maybe some of the misconceptions that arise about it, and some some of the some of the ways that we can ease the process. Perhaps that's really what we talk about. Because the definition of mindfulness itself is is quite quite simple. Because we, we get carried away by our senses. I don't know if anybody had that experience in the meditation that we just did. You know, uh, the invitation was to simply be aware of whatever arises in your experience and your reaction to what arises. But people might have had all kinds of things happening, all kinds of reactions, all kinds of thoughts that were believed and enacted upon, and you know, and um, story trains that develop and grab your attention for well you know, sometimes 35 minutes can simply be you sit down and a thought train grabs your attention and the bell goes off and you realize you've been lost in thought for the uh, for most of the time <clears throat> so that's that's what mindfulness is and it's it's um sometimes called bare attention so it's bare of any any sense of having to do anything with it, a bear of any commentary, interpretation, decision, it's just um, any, any identification um, with what's arising. So those no judgments, no grasping or rejecting what's arising, just seeing, allowing and seeing things as they are in moment by moment. No decision, no manipulation, so you're not trying to make anything in particular happen, right? So, you, yeah. Sometimes you know, we we ask each other, <clears throat> friends and Dharma friends, you know, well, how was your meditation? <laughs> the loaded question. I mean, was really good. But what does that mean? <laughs> it could mean that you sat there and you just had just really agitated mind but you were present with it. <laughs> that that would, be, would be a good meditate. Uh, or it could mean that the mind was very calm and <clears throat> was very tranquil uh, meditation. But we tend to think, oh, good meditation means calm mind. But it's, it's not the case at all. That just happened to be what arose and you were present with it. In fact, if you really want to look at um, 
the scientific research on meditation, mindfulness meditation, and the benefits of, of it in terms of creating new neural pathways that are less uh, reactive, more, um, uh, more able to be with what's arising. Then those med meditations where you're constantly drawing your attention back are the ones that are <laughs> the most useful because you're, you're, re you're creating that neural pathway. Every time your mind wanders off, you notice it, you bring it back, you've just um, created, uh, reinforced, I should say, that um, neural pathway of mindfulness. So just a little example I give sort of, so a mindful person recognizes their own experience of what's arising. So for example, if a car passes somebody who's mindful, the person knows that the car passed and they know their experience of the car passing in terms of the feelings and thoughts and so forth. The, the person that's not mindful just knows that a car passed. So that's, that's one way to look at the difference um, uh, between the two. Um, another way of looking at it is it's mirror-like, mirror -like, mirror it mirrors what's arising. So if you think of a mirror, a mirror just reflects what's in front of it. It doesn't comment or <laughs> manipulate, doesn't change the image, doesn't have anything to say about the image. It simply mirror, it mirrors what's there. And that's what you're doing with, the, with awareness, mindfulness. You're simply being aware in a mirror-like fashion, whatever presents itself in front of awareness. Just simply seeing it like a mirror would. I'm giving you some sort of metaphors or images to kind of maybe gra grabs you and gives you a sense of it. So there's no resistance to what's arising. If you think about it, if you, so say you're, you're sitting and um, a body sensation arises. <clears throat> so it's, as soon as it's in awareness, it's already happened. <laughs> That's right, it's already happened. So any resistance, you're, you're simply resisting what's already happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? You can't resist something that hasn't happened yet. You, you don't resist the body sensation before it happens. You only resist the body sensation after it happens. So you're resisting history. Mm -hmm. Because once you're aware, aware of something, it's already happened. So we're simply being aware of what's already happened. In fact, there's a little lag there. You're, even when, when you're aware of it, <laughs> there's some research that shows there's a couple of nanoseconds where uh, before you're even aware of it, it's not only happened, it's done. You can move on to something else. Because <clears throat> there's a lag time there. So you're simply... You're simply seeing. <laughs> you're simply seeing um, another way. Another word um, that I like to use is uh, as na nature. <clears throat> if somebody's got sound in the back of their uh, <laughs> the household, you might want to mute, mute your microphone. I don't know where it's coming from. Um, 
So yeah, the uh, the word nature. Just seeing nature come and go. The natural arising and passing of phenomenon of objects. Just seeing seeing nature. So there's that sometimes is a an easier way to let go of you know there's an eye that's this is all happening to so we sometimes react to that notion it's like if you put it in terms of well it's just nature happening so we're tuning into um to nature the uh the buddha's final statement to the group of people who were there when he was lying on his deathbed. He had one, uh, two sentences, was his last, was said to be the last two sentences of his teaching. Um, the two sentences are, transient are all conditioned things. Work out your deliverance with mindfulness. Transient are all conditioned things. Work out your deliverance with mindfulness. Our sati. So we're seeing the transient nature of all conditioned things. I figure if you're going to say something on your deathbed, it's probably pretty pretty important. And the last word, I guess, that he said was sati, <laughs> or mindfulness. The last words of Sariputta, who was his, <clears throat> one of his foremost disciples, was strive on with mindfulness. This is my advice for you. <clears throat> so again, um, seeing is so critical. Um, another one by the Buddha, mindfulness, O oh disciples, <clears throat> excuse me, I declare is essential in all things everywhere. It is as salt is to the curry. Not too many cooking metaphors in the Buddhist teachings, but uh, <laughs> there's one for you. Uh, so it's like salt is to curry. So ho hopefully you get the idea of what mindfulness is at that basic level. Um, and if you, you know, take a, a course that, introduces you to mindfulness, you'll spend a lot of time lying on the floor, following the sensations in your body, sitting in a chair, following the sensation of breathing, and then eventually sitting um, and following sounds, thoughts, body sensations, and so forth, as, and as they are. And then it's sort of exploring what happens as you do this. By the way, if I get cut off on the connection to the uh, meditation online meditation session, just hang out for a while and I will be back because I, I did get cut off last time and uh, I just, I guess I just disappeared <laughs> on the screen. And, but uh, it does happen at times uh, where the host gets um, disconnected. I think a lot of people are using online services at the moment with all that's uh, going on. The, um, so, so hopefully that gives you kind of the, a basic understanding of mindfulness. Now there's a couple of things to bring along with it. And one is um, the idea of continuous mindfulness or mindfulness for extended period of, periods of time. So not only when you're practicing your meditation but throughout the day and this many people find this to be challenging it's challenging because we forget to be mindful right it's challenging because we get caught up in the busyness of the day and that becomes foremost in our minds and the the, the idea of noticing what's arising as you're being busy doesn't kind of occur to us because you can be mindful and busy at the same time 
Like you don't have to move like slowly when you do everything to be mindful. It might be a little easier perhaps to be mindful, but you don't, it's not um, a prerequisite for the practice. So every word, every thought, every deed to bring mindfulness to it. Um, every moment. So this, so the the idea of effort comes in here because if we're really, you know, tight and, and striving and uh, to to re, to remain mindful when we're meditating and then we try to do that during the day, it, it it's not going to be possible. You're going to not want to do it because um, <laughs> it's you're going to get tired for one thing because it takes a lot of energy um, to 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 be mindful in that way. So I, I invite you to, to bring a more kind of a lightness to it. A light, a light awareness all day long. So it's intentional. So it's on purpose, as a, to use the very definition. Um, it's intentional. But you can bring a lightness to the awareness. Um, so we don't, we're not efforting too much and we don't then run out of energy. So of course you might need more energy in the case of um, on over, overwhelming emotions if they arise or some turmoil. You may need more energy in those times, but for the most part through our day, we can bring a, a, a lighter awareness um, to, the, to the practice. And I invite you to really experiment with that during the day is this notion of a light awareness you're just kind of being aware okay what's what's coming in the sense doors sounds sights thoughts what's my reaction to them just throughout the day and you know an anchor can be useful for that so that notion of the the breath the buddha talked about breathing you know bringing your awareness to the tip of the nose he actually didn't talk about the belly or the chest rising and falling as a place to rest your awareness in the breath meditation. Um, so the way I approach the practice is when I sit to meditate, I bring awareness to the breath at the tip of my nose. And um, if, and that is, is my anchor, and if um, I'm feeling uh, some turmoil or agitation, um, difficult emotions in my um, day or practice, then I bring them my attention to uh, my belly rising and falling. De in, inside my body, bring awareness to the body in a sense. And I kind of look at that as, as bringing awareness to the trunk of a tree. <laughs> the root of a tree, if that visual helps, and becoming grounded by bringing my attention deeper, and not not the branches, which we could kind of see as the thoughts and the the, the emotional um, energy that's out. And I find it's just a little, the tip of the nose is a little bit close to the branches, so I just kind of find lowering it down uh, to the belly. And of course, Sayadaw Mahasi. The Burmese uh, meditation master is uh, talked very much about bringing awareness to the belly and had a big influence on uh, many Western, um, early Western teachers such as Joseph Goldstein and others, who then brought that Mahasi method to um, to uh, North America. So you often hear about awareness, um, bringing awareness to the belly. But, Play around with that, you know. I said whatever feels more natural, but play around with that notion of tip of the nose as your kind of default. And then if there's more difficulties arising, then anchoring more into the body and into the belly rising and falling. Now, I'll, I'll speak more about difficult emotions as we get into this. So continuous mindfulness. Because that's, that's what this is about. You don't meditate. To just to be a good meditator, uh, you just you meditate so that this can spill over 
and, be, and you may be more likely to remember to be mindful um, during the day. And that's really where, where it's at. That mindfulness isn't, all, isn't particularly difficult. The challenge is remembering to be mindful. That's it. If you can, some, whatever you can do to remember to be mindful, that's really what will transform and change and train the mind. So some people ask even, you know, you know, why meditate? I've had numerous people ask me that over the years. Why, why meditate? Well, I'm mindful. I can just be mindful all day. I don't need to meditate. Um, I don't know if that's <laughs> possible, actually, but um, <clears throat> it's usually people that don't want to meditate that it, say that, perhaps. Um, I think mindfulness allows us to develop the skills of mindfulness. Like the meditation allows us to develop the skills of mindfulness. So you don't learn to play, but you don't learn anything without practicing it. So you're not going to learn to play the piano skillfully without sitting and practicing how to, you know, to play or any any sport or activity that you might be engaged in. There's a certain discipline to how it's done. And, this, and we call it muscle memory in sports. <laughs> it's kind of mind memory in uh, meditation. Um, so I think that's one of the, it's like any skill. And it's also a controlled environment. Right? We're, we're closing our eyes, so we're cutting off a major um, sense door that, uh, in terms of sight. Sometimes Tibetans don't close their eyes for the most part, but um, in inside meditation, we tend to uh, close our eyes. So it's a controlled environment that may actually makes it easier to practice because all, all you're doing is being aware of what arises moment by moment, non-judgmentally. <laughs> And noticing your act, reaction to it. John Kabat Zinn always liked to say it's like sewing your parachute for the day. <laughs> so if you happen to need your parachute, it's all nicely sewn, and that your meditation is like sewing your parachute for the day. And I think you're more likely to be mindful throughout the day when you've had a a practice with a practice. That's why I tend to recommend the morning as a time to practice. It just kind of resets us for the day. Makes it more likely for us to be mindful during the day. And I think when you're meditating, and from my experience as well, um, we see the more subtle aspects of our experience because there's a stillness can, might, uh, be present, which allows us to see subtleties, um, very things that are occurring that would, would fall under the radar during the, our day-to-day -day experience wouldn't, wouldn't be noticed. The subtleties of, of what's arising and the subtleties of our um, reaction to what's arising can be very, very subtle. And the more you practice, the more you start to know a, a subtle level of um, what's going on in, in the in your experience. So that, those are kind of the reasons we, we meditate. It's pretty pretty basic. Um, and of course, on we go on retreats and meditate for extended period of periods of time. For the same reasons, we allow, it allows some settling to go on of the mind and allows us perhaps to be able to deeply see what's, um, what's arising. So as I mentioned, meditation is not a relaxation technique. It's not about trying to relax or about trying to make anything happen. It's about being with what is. It's not about stopping thoughts. If, I've, if I introduce meditation to a group of people that never meditated, many of them will believe, have the belief or the misconception that 
if their mind is active, then it, they're not medit. It's not a good meditation. That there's somehow this is about stopping thoughts. Um, doesn't mean go. It's not about going into a trance. Uh, not inside meditation. Transcendental meditation has that aspect to it. Um, other types of meditation may have that um, aspect uh, to it. Um, and it doesn't involve having any profound thoughts either. <laughs> I remember when I, when early in my practice, <clears throat> I used to think I had all kinds of really profound thoughts when I was on a retreat. And I'd have all this, this elaborate, um, you know, I was going to start a retreat center and this is who I knew where it was going to be and who the cook, the chef was going to be and, you know, how I was going to organize the rooms and I had all these really well, profoundly wonderful ideas on how it was all going to be organized. And then, you know, I'd start to drive home and if, if it was a long drive home, a couple hours into the drive, you know, from from Barry, Massachusetts at Insight Meditation Society, but I'd start to think, oh, that's not all that profound. <laughs> mm -hmm. Actually, that's that's not gonna be possible at all. <laughs> this is not profound. And I, by the time I got home, if I mentioned any of it to Vida, she'd kind of go, what? I thought you were meditating. It sounds like you're in a planning session or something. <laughs> um, but you know, I had the idea that I'd have all these um, profound thoughts that would arise in the stillness of the mind, and that they would be, you know, um, oh, just profound. Um, so none, none of none of that stuff happens. Really, what what was going on was I was um, distracting myself from what was arising by sitting there and planning a fantasy. Mm -hmm. Right, I was simply distracting myself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's important to notice if you're doing that, if you're just distracting yourself. Because at a meditation retreat, we can't, you know, go in and turn on the TV or go to the fridge or whatever it might be, or um, alcohol or whatever it might be, to distract ourselves. You're just left with this mind <laughs> that just wants to, you know, and you, you, you just, if you, don't, if you don't want to stop watching when, when it's arising, then you can just start thinking about stuff, right? And that's, you're kind of, you've got your own little internal TV show to watch. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's, that's basically what I was doing. So be, be a little, be aware, of, be aware of that as well, perhaps arising in your, in your practice. Okay. Skip ahead a bit. I want to talk, um, and I'm going to talk more about both of these aspects. Um, I'd like to do a whole talk on letting go. So I got an email from someone asking about more about letting go and about relating to uh, difficult um, emotions, difficult thoughts, how to, how, how, how to handle that. So I'd like to talk about that as well. So um, letting go, we hear that so much in this practice in, in, with regards to mindfulness. Really, it's just reminding us to let things be. <laughs> so it's not, um, it's not a aversive stance. So it's letting go is not like, I'll grab something here, since we have visuals. <laughs> letting go is not, um, you know, taking something and, you know, letting it go. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Maybe I broke that. Um, <laughs> letting go. That was really letting go. That was, a, that was a version, right? You can kind of see the energy of, of getting rid of. Letting go is more like so letting it be. If you can allow that visual, just letting it be. You're not hanging on. You're just letting it go. No aversion. It just is. It just be allowing it to be. So we're not being caught in what's arising. Um, so it's the key to freedom. Because the clinging, the you know, the clinging onto 
things is is what creates our little little prison. Um, so it's it's, uh, it's it's allowing things to just flow, and it comes into your life as well in terms of equanimity, allowing things to flow in your life. So we don't fight and resist any change. Um, we trust in the process of mindfulness. So there's a, an element of patience. I can speak to this as well because of patience was as was um, uh, an something that in me impatience is something in me that would arise. So if if I didn't, if, if I didn't see progress in my practice and what I saw in progress, then I would put more energy, more efforting into it, and I would over effort, and then it would get tight. Um, so it's trusting the process, and just letting go and allowing things to be. So how do you let go? It's a question of how do I let go? Something arises and it grabs me. How do I let go of it? It means you let it be as it is. <laughs> it does not mean you throw it away or and annihilate it. It's more like setting down or letting be. And, and I think also you notice that when you don't let go, that there's suffering. When you do try to... Um, you know, push away or grasp that they're suffering. You can really start to, you can really start to see that. That's the origin of suffering. So I wouldn't overcomplicate letting go. Keep it fairly simple. And I think if, you know, we, when a, Difficult, difficulty arises. Like for example, with what's going on now in the world with the pandemic, difficulties are arising. I, I sense a, in, in myself, I sense a really uh, undercurrent of, of stress. I mean, I'm, I don't have a lot to do. It's not, it's not stress from you know, having to do a lot of things. It's just this undercurrent of, of stress that I feel in, that's, that's present right now in the world. And so letting go of that doesn't mean I get rid of it. It's not pleasant. So our, our negativity bias as humans is, well, I just, I just wish this would go away. But the practice is to just be present with it. Be present with the stress. It's, it's there. And of course, if it's overwhelming or something that's arising is overwhelming in some way, then we may have to shift our practice a little bit. We're still not trying to get rid of, but we may have to shift how we relate um, to an overwhelming emotion. So right now for me that stress is just kind of, um, it's an undercurrent. Um, so nobody's, I'm not going through extreme grief. Uh, nobody's, nobody's died in my immediate family. A, a difficult emotion this is something else that we relate to. Um, we may not hold in awareness diff really, really difficult emotions the same way we do everything else. Um, but we can notice what arises with the difficult emotion. What are, especially what arises in the body. So an emotion is simply a physical manifestation of, of thoughts. So you've had some thoughts, which then manifest in the body as usually some kind of tension 
we all experience it in some, a different way, perhaps, how we um, feel um, uh, negative emotions or difficult emotions in our body. And you, you tune into it, you'll start to see, is it a clenching in the stomach? Is it a tightening in the neck? Is it a tightening in the forehead? Those are common places that people um, feel uh, thoughts in their body, emotions. So, uh, you know, tune into that as much as you can. Um, you could go into the, the, to the belly rising and falling, as I mentioned, the tree trunk idea. And actually visualize a tree. I found that really, that's what I did this morning. I had a fairly, it was a, had a stressful night. Just different things going on with regard to the pandemic. And um, my meditation was just, it was just difficult. So I just went to, the, to my belly, went to the trunk of the tree, and just was present with the, what was the present in the body. That was my entire that was my entire meditation this morning. We can practice um, stop. That's T O P, which is um, the S actually stands for stop. Then Joanne's going like this. <laughs> um, uh, so we could practice stop, which is stop, take a breath, observe, and proceed. So if something overwhelming arises, just pause or stop. That's yeah, the you to pause, take a breath, be aware that you're breathing. Take maybe take a few breaths, maybe take a minute of breaths. Take some breaths, observe what's what's arising, so we're not shutting down to it, we're observing the full catastrophe, as John kabat would say. Observing what everything that's arising. And I would even add an eye in there in terms of investigate, to really see deeply into what's arising. It doesn't make for a great acronym, STOIP, but I would... Um, before proceeding, I would add uh, investigation. So the wisdom element is also present. So stop, you've got rain that's out there. <laughs> Recognize, um, I forget what the red, investigate maybe, not identify. There's um, the three minute breathing space, you know, you open to the, it's arising, go to your breath and open to the experience. So there's a few of those, but stop, I think, is a, a simple one to remember. Stop, take a breath, observe, investigate, and proceed. Now, so that's, you know, you're really bringing mindfulness into a difficult emotion. Now, what about um, something that's just overwhelming? Um, then that's where, you know, it's somehow you, you, sometimes you need to just dissipate that energy. You might want to go for a run, uh, whatever you kind of use in those situations to dissipate that energy, uh, chop wood, whatever. Usually it's something physical. Uh, it could be not always. Some people cook a meal, something uh, more nurturing. Um, but something that dissipates the, the energy. And this is not done in an aversive way. It's simply saying, this is too much right now for me to um, open to it. I'm going to put it aside for another day. So it's with that kind of attitude. No, no. Perhaps when it's le it's le less overwhelming, I will open to it. So I, I always start by you know open to it, see what happens, and if it feels overwhelming, um, dissipate the energy. So I'll talk more about the, again. So that'll be a whole uh, talk, I think, on. Um, um, dealing with difficult emotions. Many people come to this practice because they want to, <laughs> they're in, they're, they, they have some difficult um, difficulties arising in their experience and they want to learn how to relate to it. Um, so it's always a, a talk that's worth 
um, leading or offering. So opening to our experience, noticing our reactions to our experience, not forgetting to do all that. <laughs> so remembering to be mindful and being fa coming face to face with whatever arises. So you're looking at those sense doors, those five sense doors, that moment of contact, that's where you bring mindfulness in. I'm gonna try something here. I'm gonna try and share a screen. No, it didn't work, did it? Does it? Can you it see works. it? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, Thank you. Because I can still see you guys. Look at that. So that's um, I talked about that. I think last session or the session before. It's that top bit there, the top half. It's those three circles. When I say be aware of your experience. Those three circles represent your experience. So you have a sense organ, the bottom circle, which is, let's say, your ear. So it would be the five senses plus mind and thought. So let's say the sense organ is your ear. The sense experience is the sound. And then sense consciousness is the fact that you are aware of the sound. So those three things come together, you have contact. And that's basically your life, right there in those three circles. If one of those is missing, you don't have an experience. And you, if you can't, if you don't have a hearing organ, you won't hear the sound, won't be your experience. If you, if there's no sound, you won't hear it. And if you're not aware of it, so there could be a sound out there, you have the ear, but you, you're not aware of it. There's no consciousness of it. So as soon as you have that sound, sight, sensation, taste, touch, and um, thought, six, every time that happens, you have a feeling tone of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Every single time, one of those three feeling tones will arise. And that's based on your perceptions of events. So if something may be unpleasant because based on your experience, previous, your memory and history, it's a certain type of music is unpleasant and so on. Um, that's where, my, where you bring mindfulness in right there. So you're aware of what's arising to your sense doors, to your sense organs. You're aware of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, what's arising based on that contact. And you just bring mindfulness there. And perhaps before craving and clinging arise. Of course, if craving, <laughs> your reaction is some craving, then you notice that. Hey, that worked, huh? I did an experiment earlier and it worked, so I'm glad. Is that di I find that diagram helpful in, because when I say be aware of your experience, well, what do I mean, right? And, and really it's, it's those sense doors, those six sense doors that we're talking about that you're bringing awareness to and then what is your reaction to it so you're just simply watching the show you're just watching this but you know we get we get it's so easy to get hooked by it all right we get hooked by it or triggered in some way and then we're not watching it anymore we're being thrown around by it and really that this practice is a practice of 
being able to be present with whatever arises so that we can respond from a place of balance rather than just being at the whim of <laughs> of uh, the you know, of of our past in some ways we're creating the, the new neural pathways does all the work and in some in some ways just the fact that we're mindful create just creates a pause it just if you're aware of what's arising there's by definition a pause before there's a response so being mindful changes what happens next always being mindful will change what happens next if you're you know, the buddha used the word heedless <laughs> um I've heard the word mindless used as well i just say if you're not mindful i guess you, you're heedless then what happens next is based on your conditioning it's mm -hmm. it's based on the, your past what triggers you um, with mindfulness something different is possible yeah i'd really like to use some time for for questions because there's usually a few on this um this topic and we have this um protocol i guess and i think it works really well on zoom i'm going to introduce it to uh, my non-dharma groups as well <laughs> it's uh you go like this before you speak and uh, when you're finished speaking so i'll, I'll just open it up for any questions I have to turn off mute, I guess. Oh, let me unmute all. Oh, some people have muted themselves. So yeah, you have to unmute yourself. If you've muted yourself, I can't unmute you by the looks of it. Again, if I go individually, yeah. Go ahead. So you mentioned something earlier about trust and um, that seems it's, it occurs to me that it might be foundational in this whole thing because we're programmed to to problem solve and to use logic to solve all the all our problems and and um, you know to some extent that makes sense but but when it when we get into suffering when we're in a position where too much of that leads to suffering it's hard to let go because that's what we we're, we're conditioned, we're trained to use our minds to save ourselves or to protect ourselves. And yet too much of that or, or whatever can get into suffering, then we have to trust that if we let go, it'll be okay. And that's hard. Yeah, and it, it, it's 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 um, you, you've really pointed to the um, wouldn't say the, the difficulty, but or the challenge. You, wouldn't, you, you use either one of those words, but the um, what what makes the process lengthy? <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> why it doesn't happen quickly? Like why can't you medit meditate for a week and then? You know, um, everything be you know so you'd find the end, see the end of suffering, and because we're it's we created decades to create this state of mind, it's not something that's going to um, shift overnight. It's going to take time to 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 see how we're creating this suffering, and as you said, trust the process. Um, especially I find at certain points in our practice, trust 
um, is is um, quite important. And you'd think it would be more or more or more crucial, I guess. You'd think it would be more at the beginning, but it's actually quite along along the path. So the you know the, the hindrances they say doubt is the last one to go, and I think that's the you know we we start to see some changes, but there's just, just some doubt that then arises um, in terms of the process. So yeah, there is a there's a sense of of faith in a way, confidence, trust. That this not blind faith, not in that sense, but it, this, a sense of faith that this is a path to a, a transformation. Um, and there, there is deep change going on, really deep change. And change, changing habitual patterns that got us to where we are. Pretty good, like, you know, there's suffering, but you know, it's the logical mind got me through childhood, I'm still alive, I'm still able to, you know, to, to practice. It got me to the point where I can practice. So there's, you know, it's it's um, it's hard to see how that can't also solve this kind of more spiritual question. How the logical mind can't then also solve this kind of um, suffering that's happening at a different level. Yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful insight. Thank you, Anita. I found um, the, the focus on mindfulness this evening very helpful and, and grounding. Um, I've been finding the situation, the pandemic, everything going on very difficult. And I've been finding a huge amount of resistance uh, within me. And uh, like I sort of get distracted with something maybe something on television and then I come back and it's like, I don't want to be here. Like, I don't want to be in this world I, or I'm asleep and I'm sort of off in another world and I wake up and it's like, Oh yeah, this I'm back to this again. And I don't want to be there. And I think what you said about letting go, um, the focus being letting it be as it is, it just reminded me that's not what I'm doing. Uh, I'm, sort of looking at it as a letting go, I shouldn't be feeling that resistance. I shouldn't be uh, pushing that away. Uh, I shouldn't be sort of angry and I'm judging myself for doing that. And the reminder just maybe to soften, take a lighter approach and just try and let it be just as it is. I, I think that's a helpful thing for me to focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have all kinds of. Um, I just love all the all the different noises and, and stuff that happen when you do these things. <laughs> <I just love it. laughs> we're we're like we're like we're in each other's homes, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's kind of the what makes it. Uh, so I don't mind at all dogs barking and it's, uh, <laughs> your groceries being delivered or whatever it might be. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I find um, my emotional state is heightened in in all di in, in all directions. So it's so it's um, it's sensing into joy in a, in a more heightened way, but also sensing into anger in a more heightened way, um, sadness in a more heightened way, and having to 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 be able to open and allow that those emotions as they're arising it's a you know if if difficulties are the path which we hear over and over again you don't become enlightened when your life is most most comfortable and easy mm -hmm. right you enlightenment comes when we're challenged to open to the difficult then this time is ripe for practice um, with all the sadness, anger, joy, compassion, everything that's kind of just 
flowing through us. Um, and, and, you know, so opening to it, really opening to it. I, I went to, um, uh, <clears throat> I had to get some groceries for, for several friends who were in, who were in quarantine. And um, so I went to, the, uh, to, to Costco at, at the seniors hour. Um, I fit the description <laughs> and uh, it's from eight to nine. I thought there'll be less people uh, there. They, they just apparently wiped the place down before, um, you know, before the people, first people come. I went there and it was a, just a terrible situation of many very elderly people just overwhelmed by the mass of people that were there and um, really exposing themselves mm -hmm. because of the closeness of the contact that was really forced upon us by the line, the way we we're lining up and so on. I won't go into the details and hopefully they've solved it, but um, anger really arose in me. And my, mm -hmm. what, what the, the thoughts were kind of like, you know, I've got to go <laughs> yell at somebody about this, <laughs> you know, and then the, the, the another thought came, well, you know, they're, they're doing their very best and they're actually putting their selves at risk by having food of, by offering this food available. So, you know, all this, this flood of thoughts, but there was a real sense of, of anger that then turned into sadness, anger for what, for that being allowed to happen. And then sadness because people were being put at, very elderly people were being put at, at risk. Um, and just opening to that and allowing that to just be. So, I mean, I, I literally just had to pause and then um, feel into my body. What's arising in the body? I'm feeling tightness in my forehead. My stomach's clinching. You know, my, my, there's a tightening in my, in my chest area. And actually a little bit of um, a sharpness in, in, in the chest area. And just tuning into those body sensations and then watching the thoughts that are arising. The thoughts about how did they let this happen? They, you know, and you know the, the, the blaming thoughts, and seeing and watching how that was then feeding into more anger. And once I saw that that's what was going on, it it, it was able to, well, it, it 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 dissipated and was replaced with sadness, which then I had to, then I, the practice was to then to feel um, and open to the sadness. But your your points, well taken, were in the midst of all these extreme, I think, emotions that are arising and um, doing the best we can at staying open uh, to, to what's arising. I, um, I hope I understood this correctly. As I understood, Stephen, what you were saying was that um, emotions are kind of thoughts as expressed in the body, sensations that come from the mind down to the body. But I've also heard it said um, the absolute uh, opposite, that um, we, we experience something in the body and then it just kicks in on our default loop. So I may be experiencing some, whatever, tightness in the chest, um, which then the mind becomes aware of and, oh, oh that's, you know, that's that uh, uh, kicks into the, the default loop of the old stuff rather than, oh, I'm, I'm frustrated with the Costco experience. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Thank you. Well, I guess to quote the Buddha, mind is the forerunner of all things. <laughs> um, it's one way to, if you, if you have a sensation in the body and then it's noticed and there's a thought about it, and then an emotion comes. It's still the thought, I think, that brought about the emotion. Um, thoughts, I mean, emo what, you know, if, 
we don't really have to figure out at a scientific level what an emotion is. I think we just need, we just, that for this practice, have a felt sense of, of it um, is enough. Uh, but I think that the, the practice of, or at least, and I'm not the only one that finds this helpful. It's kind of the, the way that in this practice that we relate to difficult emotions is to go into the body to see what how the how it's manifesting um, in the body um, this is kind of the first first step into this and then you know looking at what thoughts are arising that are are feeding it are feeding the emotion because if there's no if you go into the body and then there there's no additional thoughts emotion will dissipate pretty quickly it needs a story to feed it. It really does. It needs a, a storyline, someone to blame, <laughs> someone to, you know, it's usually the case. Or, or you blame yourself, perhaps, or uh, a sense to, to you know, the, the thoughts of fixing something. Those thoughts actually came up to how would I organize this? You know, differently. So fix, the fix its thoughts come up, with it. depending on your mind, different. Thoughts arise, and that feeds feeds the emotion. So I think if we can just understand it at that that level, um, where it comes from initially is maybe not as important as what's um, you know where do we bring our attention when it does happen. Just to start out that way, at least make that the practice where do we bring our attention when a strong emotion arises to the emotion and then if that's overwhelming then you know we can dis dissipate the energy I often find that when the uh, the emotion is strong, I have to go, I have to start backtracking to figure out what it is that, what was the thought that, mm -hmm. because that thought was so quick and fleeting that I've, I've missed, I've missed what's happened and I'm already well into the action before I stop to realize what it is that's happened. And that's, that mostly happens with really strong and intense personal feelings, um, things that affect you know, my family or my personal, I guess, safety and security. So uh, I find it a real challenge. And when, when you're sitting and meditating, often those strong, quick emotions uh, and thoughts, they don't come up as much in, in the meditation. Um, is that something you could speak about, please? So these are uh, ab abrupt kind of emotional changes in, in emotional, in emotions and mood uh, during the day, not in sitting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, those those can build up too over time, right? So there's probably there could be a whole culmination um, of events and thoughts that lead to that uh, what appears to be an abrupt shift. So uh, you know, my my invitation would be just to bring to look at bringing more mind continuous mindfulness into the day. Um, yeah, remembering to be mindful in as many moments of the day as we can as is possible just to see what all those what those little building blocks are to that with what looks like a sudden shift i know what you i i, I felt the same kind of <clears throat> the same kind of things for me it's even what happens while i'm sleeping <laughs> um is part of the building process 
If, so then, you know, <clears throat> a few things will happen in the morning and then all of a sudden my moods shift. And I can think, oh yeah, back to the, I had this dream and then this in, in the night. So it can actually build <clears throat> even through our dream state. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's yeah, it's a kind of a, a building process that then looks like a sudden shift. So bring mindfulness, this continuous mindfulness. Um, there's a wonderful book. I don't think I have it here. Um, it's, um, I forget the title too. Ajahn Tanjaniya, which won't do you a lot of good if <laughs> spelling Tanjaniya be a challenge. But he, he is, um, if, if you send me an email, I'll send you a, a link to some of his stuff. He uh, um, really speaks, uh, one of his primary topics is continuous mindfulness. And I, this, I really absorb this. He, he's a Burmese um, meditation teacher as well a more, a, a more recent one than you know like Mahasi and others he uh, um, is still teaching uh, and a wonderful teacher and, and really for some reason relates to the western <laughs> mind of over efforting <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was his natural tendency even as a uh, as a child um, so he talks about light awareness and uh, continuous awareness and continuous awareness being possible if there's a lightness brought to it and not possible or very difficult if it's a, a tight efforting that's brought to it. And I found that was just, just changed so many things in my, um, in my practice, just hearing that. Thank you. Am I still muted? No, we hear we hear you. Okay, everything's good. All right. Um yeah. Unpleasant. That's been my like BFF right now. A whole lot of that going down. Um, and then one of these things that's helped me, I was listening to another one of my teachers was you know, doing Zoom broadcasts. So I was listening to Vinny out on the West Coast and on Friday night and he dropped this phrase and it was just a gem and I really wanted to share it. Um, and I've been coming back to it so much when, when that wave of unpleasantness arises. Um, that, and it's, what expectation of normal did you let go of today? <laughs> did we keep track? <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Thanks, Micah, for that. I I really like that, and and I was thinking I was quickly I'm sort of struck by it. And I'm thinking, why why do I like that? What what is it about that that strikes me? And it's well, it's um I think I can see. First of all, it's kind of funny, but it's also very very helpful because we've just talked about mindfulness, and then we have this sort of question, this this really really hard hitting and, and fundamental foundational question, um, which really brings us to mindfulness. That's an excellent question because it really brings us back to awareness and it has everything in it to me. It, it's, it's talking about, you know, what's going on. It, it brings us to awareness of the fact that what's going on is not normal and, and that we have to let go, you know, in a, in, with lightness. It's a, a little bit humorous and maybe tongue in cheek, but, but 
It's also very helpful. I, I think that's great. I think I can understand why you like it. I'm going to think of that one too. Thank you. This doesn't really relate to anything in particular, but I was just saying to my my husband today that you know while what we're going through in this world is 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 tragic and horrible and brings with it all kinds of pain and suffering, I think the opportunities are boundless, and that brings me great joy and fear because it could go so beautifully well and this could be such a growth opportunity for humanity and on the other hand it could not go that well but i i feel that this is truly a gift given to humanity and i don't know why but i feel that it's it's such an opportunity for mankind and so i i i feel very hopeful despite all the suffering that's that's going on and maybe that's just the way my mind is trying to tell me well this is how i can make sense of it but i just i just want to i just want to think the best of it so peace and blessings to you all Okay, I'll, um, I'll uh, end it here with a thank you to everyone for, for showing up for this. And uh, what we are experiencing right now is, is our new normal. <laughs> mm. And uh, wanting it to be any other way is, 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 a, is a resistance to what is. Doesn't mean we don't do our best to keep ourselves safe and those around us safe. But um, we are opening to a different way of being in the world. And we can do so with compassion and kindness and love and sadness and anger <laughs> and everything else. Uh, the full uh, human, the full catastrophe of, of uh, <laughs> emotions and thoughts that are going to arise with this. But really take it as a as a, a blessing, as you said, in the sense of really a chance to practice. There's so much to practice with, and for some of us, I'm not saying all of us, there's uh, more time to practice. My, my minutes per day of practice is skyrocketed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's... Uh, and then and opening has allowed me then to open to, to all these, all this all this variety of of what's arising with it with what's going on so i hope to see you all next week and thanks again for showing up to the online session it just it brings a lot of joy to my life to be able to do this and to be able to to see you all in your little boxes at home <laughs> 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 and to hear your laughs and every smiles yeah so thanks. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Yeah.
Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Stay well. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs>